And then after this, we will, for the rest of December, have some uh, messages with Christmas uh, themes then to them. You know, I heard of this uh, story about one guy who was a, um, of a cynic, and uh, he, uh, he was kind of thinking that he was kind of smart in his own mind and giving God a hard time saying, God, how you made things just really wasn't too uh, smart how you did some things. He said, I mean, look, he says, after all, you made this big, uh, huge tree, strong, and then you put tiny little, almost weightless nuts in this nut tree. He says, and then you have these tender little fragile plants, and then you have them grow big, huge watermelons, heavy watermelons. And as he was sitting there under this tree, all of a sudden a nut fell out and hit him on the head. And it kind of stunned him. He thought, boy, thank God they didn't put watermelons up there. <laughs> God always has a reason for what he does. So that's good. All right. Let's begin in prayer. Lord, thank you again for this good morning. Thank you for the uh, winter season. We th we're thankful for all four seasons. We give you uh, thanks for how you design things. You do things perfectly. Uh, and so we, we trust you. Thank you that you're good and you're always good. I pray now that you'd help us to look at this passage as we read earlier and to apply it. And, and, uh, and I pray you give us insight through your spirit as we look into your scriptures. And Lord, we're reminded too. Lord, help us to remember in prayer this week the uh, uh, President Bush family as, we, uh, as they experience the loss of their grandfather. And uh, Lord, we pray you be with the family. May they sense your presence and comfort. Uh, and, um, and may the nation uh, uh, experience good things too and be reminded again of the brevity of life and that there's a more to life than just our few years here and uh, to help people to think about eternal things. And I pray that many would place their trust in you. So I pray this in Christ's name, amen. Well, let's see, a couple of questions here. What, uh, what book of the Bible talks about, you should know this one, the Tower of Babel? Genesis, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, I read it earlier, all right. Uh, what city was the tower built in? Yeah, good, Tower of Babel, all right. Uh, what modern day country is this found in? Anyone know? Iraq, yeah, yeah, this is kind of the area that we're talking about, all right, the area of Shinar and so on. Uh, now this would be a bonus if you get this, this is good but it's in the scriptures. Who was the leader of that city? Nimrod, Nimrod. yes, real good. All right, Genesis, uh, I think it's nine or 10, yeah, it talks about that. Uh, then, then this, was this tower a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, bad, this is a bad thing. Okay, so that's important to know to understand this. This is not a good thing they were doing. All right, so what happened next is last time we, well, last week we talked about Thanksgiving. Week before that, we talked about the third sea and our seven seas catastrophe. We talked about Noah's flood. What happened after that historic, catastrophic worldwide flood? Well, you know, as they landed on the mountains of Ararat, well, they got off the ark and the animals and they came down the mountains and, you know, started to live. Well, uh, you know, God told them to be fruitful, to multiply, and to fill the earth. So, what do they do? It says, hey, let's not be dispersed abroad. Let's all gather in one spot. And, and in fact, let's even start our own new religion. That's what they were doing. I mean, they were directly disobeying God. And so they end up building this great tower, probably more like a, a ziggurat, I think is how you say it, kind of like a pyramid, maybe something like that. Anyway, a very tall, uh, very tall building, that, you know, in their day, in their time, uh, and so they were quite uh, proud of that. But we have to ask this, what was so bad about building a tower? I mean, you know, wasn't it just a, a, you know, a neat building uh, that they were doing? What's, you know, what could be bad about it? Well, in Bible times, how they would, you know, they paid a lot more attention to what they named things. The naming something is very important. And they, I think it was Arabic, the Arabic name for this uh, tower, uh, Babel, means in their language that they spoke there, uh, the word means gateway to the gods. And that's what they were seeking to build. 
a, uh, this wasn't just a, uh, they were intentionally, they were deliberately, they knew full well what they were doing. They were building a religious structure, a temple of sorts, that uh, to honor their new religion that they were devising. They, uh, you know, they weren't just, this wasn't just a chance for them to show off their building skills, you know. They were, uh, it was to be like a portal, like a doorway, a gateway for these uh, dark powers to come and join with men. Well, uh, in Hebrew though, the word Babel sounds a lot like the word for confusion. And the irony is quite striking between these two words. Uh, while they thought they were building a gateway to heaven, God says, no, the only uh, uh, gateway you're building is to utter confusion. They thought they were building a gateway for the gods, and God says, no, you're just, you're building a, a doorway to, again, to confusion. And their uh, sexual immorality was uh, so rampant then, so widespread, thanks in part to the teaching and example of their legendary queen, uh, uh, Sami Ramis. There's different ways of saying that, her name. Um, in fact, it's, it's I think maybe what we might do is the next few weeks we're going to be in some Christmas messages. We'll get back to these seven C's. It'll be maybe about in January, maybe second Sunday or in middle of January. Maybe, and what I'll, I'll do then is I'll tell you an ancient love story about this queen and, and from the guy here in scriptures and how it had... The, the impact that it had back then and the ramifications that we still feel to this day. That's quite a story. All right, but that'll be coming up, that'll be in January. But the uh, uh, famous uh, writer from the Middle Ages, poet Dante, he writes this about her. Uh, he says, Empress over lands of many tongues, her vicious tastes had so corrupted her she licensed every form of lust with laws to cleanse the stain of scandal she had spread. In other words, the, the uh, immorality was uh, so widespread that people were starting to say, this, this is scandalous, this is wrong, you can't do this. So what does she do? Instead of, oh, I'll change my ways. No, she doesn't. instead of changing her ways, she just said, I'll change the laws. There, see, now it's not illegal anymore, it's just fine. You know, we still do that to this day too, don't we? That's why it reminds us, just because something is not illegal does not mean it's right. Or to put it differently, just because something is legal does not at all mean that it's right. Well, I'll move on. Uh, Babel represents our fourth C, uh, confusion. In our seven C, seven major world events, uh, throughout history, that, that, that's still uh, looking at them from a biblical or Christian perspective and how they still affect us to this day. But, you know, they used to speak the kind of the story, they used to speak one language, and uh, instead of uh, God told them to spread out, they weren't doing that, they were gathering together in one great city to make a name for themselves. And so God does this unique thing where he goes and he f forces them to speak in different languages. So they couldn't understand each other anymore. I'm sure probably people of the same family probably all spoke the same language and, you know, and, and they would start gathering with other people who spoke the, the same language. So, hey, I can understand him. And so they formed groups and then it says they scattered. And so it was, it was a unique way that God used to get them to do what he already told them to do, fill the earth. And they said, well, we're not filling the earth, we're staying here. And so God comes up with this very unique way to get them to spread out. All right, so I want to take just a quick look this morning at six uh, practical truths, contemporary truths that we can learn from this historical tower of Babel. All right, first, and this all on your sheet there, don't compromise your faith. You know, in politics, you often you have to compromise, just get something done. But spiritually, whenever you spiritually compromise, that's a bad thing. Um, it's like people saying, you know, I, some will say today, I know Jesus said that he is the only way to God, but you know what, that was years ago. They were naive back then. We're a lot smarter now. And, uh, you know, we're smarter than Jesus because we know now there are many ways to God. Jesus was wrong. And, you know, they might not say it quite so blatantly, 
But in essence, that's what they're saying. I mean, wow, what dangerous ground to be on. What confusion to say something like that. And so we can ask this, are there any areas in your life, are there any areas in your life where you uh, believe something different than what Jesus believed? If so, that's an area of spiritual compromise in your life. And so don't compromise your faith. Uh, the people in Babel and who, who originally started to, you know, back then many of them believed in God, the one true God, uh, after Noah and his family. But now they had uh, uh, degenerated, and degenerated is appropriate word, into uh, making gods and beliefs of their own, their own religion, of their own liking. Let's see, did my sound go out? Is, uh, can you still hear? Or Okay. It sounded like to me like the sound had gone out. But All right. Good. Well, let me know if I'll sign if you don't hear. So now I can use this. But anyway, the, people still do that to this day too. Don't, uh, uh, you know, making beliefs according to their own preference. All right. Don't compromise faith. Second, remember who's numero uno. Remember who's number one. And it's not you and it's not me. I remember hearing uh, Zig Ziglar once speak and he was saying, he said, you know, I've said this before, there is a God, he'd, he'd tell the group, uh, but it ain't me. And he said, it ain't you either. You know, that's especially when all the new age beliefs were so prominent. And Shirley MacLaine and all the things she was saying, that she's God and so on. Remember who's numero uno, put God first. The leaders of Babel were saying, no, well, let's go make a name for ourselves. They had forgotten that they were existing to make God's name great, to magnify him. You know, every person has an inner drive for significance. That's a good thing, God put it there. He designed us that way. But he designed us so that we would find our security and significance in our personal relationship with him as uh, sons and daughters of the King of Kings. Something that you know, can't be taken from you. But instead, uh, you know, our, our enemy perverts that desire and seeks us, helps us, to, you know, we start seeking our significance <clears throat> by making a name for ourselves, uh, demanding that others you know, applaud us or to be recognized. Seeking fame and glory apart from God. You know, it's kind of interesting. God caused David's name to be great I think in part because David had set out to make God's name great. And, uh, and God honored him as part of that. Unlike the people of Babel here who just wanted to make their name great. So remember who is numero, numero uno. Uh, put God first. is a wise thing. Always a wise thing. As John the Baptist said, he must increase. I must decrease. Point three, disobedience always carries a price tag. It always does. We probably, you know, probably all of us could tell stories on this one. Um, you know, look at Adam and Eve's disobedience. Look what it cost them. Uh, Jonah's disobedience, you know, landed him in the drink. Uh, Saul's disobedience cost him his life. Um, we could go on. But know this, whether big or small, disobedience always carries a price tag. You, you, never dis, you never get away with something. You may think, oh, I got away with that, nothing happened. No, no, it always has a price tag, either then or later or in ways you don't even see. It can, little things, it could be where your peace is gone or diminished or your joy is gone or little things tend to irk you more than what you know they should or uh, your relationships suffer, or even things like your clarity of thought suffers or your creativity. Uh, Lots, lots of ways. One of the price tags that often people pay is in the area of just, it leads to all kinds of spiritual confusion, uh, where they start believing things that are partly true or outright lies. And so we can ask this question, the good question, what might be some of the lies we believe today? Well, we can, we can go on and on with that. But, you know, even a couple as it pertains to, to the Lord, I, you know, I've heard people say this, you know, I don't think God loves me anymore. And the implication is, you know, if God loved me, I wouldn't be in this big mess that I'm in. So I'm in a big mess, so apparently God doesn't love me anymore. I mean, there's just so many things wrong with that statement on so many levels, it's a lie. Uh, or it's, um, 
or lies like, um, you know, God is cruel, God's unfair. Uh, the Bible's old, it's uh, not relevant anymore, therefore I can ignore it. Or um, um, there might be some other ones we could think of. You know, God, God's there just to take all the fun out of my life. These are all lies um, that people sometimes tend to believe. Everything from heretical Christian teachings to all, all paganism to um, all false religions actually had their start in Babylon. You know, from Mormonism to Kabbalah to pantheism to Wicca to astrology, they all had their beginnings in Babel. Uh, from Babel to Babylon, from Herod, from Nimrod to Herod to Hitler. Uh, you know, God has shown it does not pay, it doesn't pay to disobey him. He always gets the last word. And that's good. You know, so, and we see this too, the son or daughter or any person who's, who embraces a rebellious lifestyle against God uh, discovers eventually that it leads to a very deep enslavement. Sometimes you hear people say, oh, you know, I, they're leading this uh, rebellious lifestyle, and they go, now I'm free. I, I'm free to do whatever I want. No one controls me or tells me what to do. I'm free. And it, on the outside, that's what they're saying, but man, it doesn't take long. Or, and they soon discover, too, you look underneath, and you, or it doesn't even have to be underneath, and you, soon you discover, or they will discover, that they are in a far deeper bondage than they ever were before. Because disobedience always, always has a price tag. That's one of the things we learned from this. And so that's, that's a good thing for us to remember. Now I'm glad again, that's why we have communion, God's mercy, his grace, his forgiveness is there. We come to him, we mess up, sure, of course we do. We turn, we, we repent, we come back to Christ, he forgives us, we press on with joy. Oh, we love that. But, oh, let me go on. Number four, the more things change, the more they stay the same. You ever heard that the phrase? What's the, you know, the French for? Plus ça change, plus la même chose. About some of the only French I remember. But uh, times change, technology changes, rules change. Uh, human nature doesn't change. Uh, in one sense, it's kind of hard to imagine that here, just a few generations after God destroyed the world through this worldwide catastrophic flood that we have tons of evidence for today, um, that here already the whole generation is united in rebellion against God again, already. Every new generation we see these seeds of mistrust and suspicions and doubts, and where does that come from? Every generation, where does that come from? Well. You know, much keeps changing, but much always keeps staying the same. You know, is that like that old phrase, same old, same old. You know, when uh, Solomon observed, uh, there is nothing new under the sun. Uh, he wasn't talking about technology. He was talking about the human heart. All right, number five. God's always looking for people who are willing to stand with him. You know, even in the toughest times, God has always had his faithful remnant. Uh, people who will st stand for him. And the Bible says God is looking for people who are willing to stand with him. In fact, I think we have some uh, verses, people who he can work through and release his power through. There's one, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth. Why? In order to strengthen that person whose hearts are fully committed to him. That's really an encouraging verse. That's, that's awesome. Why well, the next one, I'll bring you near and you'll come close to me. Devote yourself to be close to me. See, religion, Christianity isn't a religion of do's and don'ts and rituals and all that. Man, I, I rejected that myself. Christianity is a personal relationship with the living God and we can devote ourselves to be close to him. Being close to him is the most exciting thing ever that there will ever be. And there's no end to it and it keeps getting better. Another one, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge here in this translation, or it says, stand in the gap. Well, there it says, and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy, but how sad, I found no one. Isn't that something? It's not easy to stand in the gap. You know, a gap is, or you're talking about a gap in the wall. You, know, you see the cities and you have a wall around them for protection. 
And if there's a hole in the wall, if there's a gap in the wall, well, you know, that's what he's talking about. There's a, there's a hole in the wall, and I need someone to stand there to protect that spot. And God says, I couldn't find anyone. There are few there are who want to stand in the gap. It's not easy standing in the gap because the enemy, when he wants to attack, he's going to attack the gap. That's, his, that's the weak spot. I remember that. Uh, I won't go off on that. I remember on the Alamo, they had defended it pretty well. They had one weak spot. Sure enough, wasn't long the enemy came through that in the gap. Anyway, uh, but there. Uh, but it takes it takes courage. Uh, it takes to stand in the gap. It takes guts to stand in the gap. It takes faith. It takes time. And most people are just too busy with their own problems to be willing to stand in the gap. But you know, it's, the people who pray are like. I like to think of them as they're like God's undercover agents that he works through. Um, or, or this cult by uh, Andrew Murray. You know, because those are the people, you know, God gets things done through them. They're, they're standing in the gap, as it were. And uh, Andrew Murray once said this, uh, God rules the world through the prayers of his saints. So God's looking for people who are willing to stand with him. Will you be a person who, who will stand with God? And one more, history likes to repeat itself. I mean, in one sense, history never repeats itself exactly. It's, you know, it's always a little different. The names change, the places change, and it's never exactly the same. But yeah, the, whole, the same general pattern seems to reemerge over and over again. Because one of the things that we'll see here is that this Tower of Babel, uh, the city, its ruler, are really prototypes of our enemy's end time strategy. In fact, maybe, well, maybe I shouldn't promise it. Maybe after we look at that ancient love story, it might be interesting before we leave Babel, uh, you know, it's quite a study to study Babel, which, you know, becomes Babylon throughout the scriptures. And that plays a prominent part in, maybe we might look at that in Revelation 17 and 18 uh, about Babylon the Great. But anyway, uh, the Bible says again, one day yet a, a new city will arise, Babylon the Great, and it will deceive the nations and it will prepare the earth for the greatest reign of terror in its history. In fact, um, A.W. Pink says this concerning that. He says, in Nimrod and his schemes, we behold Satan's initial attempt to raise up a universal ruler of men. You know, so I'm going to conquer the world. Uh, Nimrod's uh, inordinate desire for fame, in the mighty power that he wielded, in his ruthless and brutal methods, in his blatant defiance of the Creator, in his founding of the Kingdom of Babel, we cannot fail to see that we have a wonderfully complete, typical, a type, picture of the person, the work, and the destruction of the Antichrist. In other words, our enemy is going to try it again. He has plans, but you know, God has his plans too and God's side will win out. Well, it's interesting too, and it says here in the text as we read it, it says God had to come down to see this big tower they had built. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's like it wasn't, uh, he couldn't even, you know, stoop down to see it. He had to come down to see this thing. You know, they thought it was a great achievement, and God said, it's like it's so small, I gotta come way down there just to see that little thing. I mean, it just shows that the greatest architectural achievements of man are still like anthills before God. So, again, so God has always had his faithful remnant. And so we can ask the question, you know, are you part of that faithful remnant? You know, there's always just two teams. There's God's team. You know, you're either with God or you're against God. Uh, you don't want to be against God. Uh, and Jesus offered his life, he gave us life so that we could be a part of that faithful remnant by all those who confess their, repent of their sins and place their trust in Christ. Can be a part of that faithful remnant, his church. And that's part of some what we uh, celebrate here in uh, communion. We uh, practice an open communion here, it means it's for all those who are on God's team. It's for all those who have embraced Christ through faith. And 
As we read to it, Paul talks about 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 there. He talks about before we partake of communion, it's open for all people, it's, open, it's for sinners like us. It's not for perfect people. Uh, none of us would qualify then. But to examine ourselves and to see, ideally, you know, before a person always comes to church, you'd want to prepare your hearts. Church really should start Saturday night. I mean, preparing your hearts and minds for to meet with God. And, and, and ideally, but for sure, and before communion, Paul talks about to examine yourselves and to make sure that there's not something there in your life that um, is not right. That God's saying, no, that's not right. And, and, and that we can quickly confess that and experience his forgiveness, his cleansing, uh, right now, right on, on the spot. And so it prepares our hearts to be able to take communion then with the right heart attitude and right attitude. Uh, about this. And so the Lord's Supper uh, is really, it is a communion. It's a communion with God uh, through Christ. It's a communion with one another. It's, we're part of his family. Uh, and so it reminds us of the oneness we have with one another and with Christ. And so that's something to celebrate. And we remember that. And like Paul writes about when in 1 Corinthians uh, 11, he describes communion. He says this, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, uh, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Well, let's pray. Lord, here in these quiet moments as we are about to partake of the Lord's Supper. That here we have this uh, quite simple procedure, process, it's nothing magical, and yet it's very significant and special. Because not only does it remind us of what you did for us there on the cross, that you willingly offered up your life for us, the just for the unjust, and so that now all who look to you with eyes of faith and trust you can have their sins forgiven, a new life, a new hope. We become grafted into your family and your forever family. And that is really exciting. And we're very grateful for that. And Lord, if there's something in our hearts and reminds us too that you're coming again. And so Lord, if there's something in our, in our lives that's not right, uh, this is the perfect time to uh, deal with that to confess these things to you and, and, and to experience your forgiveness, your cleansing, and so that we can go out from here with, again, our heads held high in great joy and seeking to honor you and to do the things that you've called us to do. And so Lord, I, I pray now that as we hand out these, uh, first these, this bread, Lord, I pray that we might again be reminded of what it cost you and your death on the cross for us, shedding your blood for our sins. And we give you thanks for that in Jesus' name.